Imagine that you have great results from your IPA analysis and have submitted your manuscript to a top journal. You are excited and really feel that you're going to make a breakthrough in your field. You get the reviewer's comments back, and they are very positive. However, one reviewer asks, Did you adjust your p-values to take into account multiple hypothesis testing? If not, I don't believe these results. You might be wondering what adjusting p-values or what multiple hypothesis testing means. You might have recalled seeing adjusted p-values, q-values, or FDRs in your dataset, and wondered what they are, and how and whether you should make use of them. You might not have realized that correcting for multiple hypothesis testing is an option that you can make use of in IPA. It's good practice to take multiple hypothesis testing into account, as otherwise you might be more susceptible to false discoveries. In this video, I'm going to describe what multiple hypothesis testing means and how you can let IPA effortlessly make p-value adjustments for you. Imagine that you performed an experiment where you treated a group of mice with a drug and you generated RNA-seq data from their blood and other tissues. Because you believe that the drug should have an effect on metabolism, you suspect that differentially expressed genes in a pathway might be overrepresented in the treated mice as compared to controls that received no drug. We need IPA to perform statistics to test this hypothesis. We first define our null hypothesis, which in this case is the assumption that the proportion of dataset molecules involved in this pathway is no larger than what we would expect if we had submitted a dataset of randomly chosen molecules. Researchers often calculate a p-value to determine whether they can reject or retain a null hypothesis. IPA uses the right-tailed Fisher's exact test to determine which biological entities are significantly enriched in your dataset. We described the p-value in more detail in a previous video, but briefly, the p-value is the probability of observing a result as extreme or more extreme than the result you obtained, if the null hypothesis is true. You make the judgment about whether you can reject the null hypothesis by comparing the p-value to a predefined significance level, also known as alpha. A result with a p-value less than alpha is considered to be statistically significant. For example, if you chose an alpha of 0.05, you would reject the null hypothesis if the observed p-value is less than the alpha. However, there is always a chance that what seems like a statistically significant result is actually a false positive. Its probability is controlled by the significance level alpha. False positives are problematic it's possible that you could unknowingly reject a null hypothesis when in reality no real difference exists between the groups of samples you're testing. If you have only one hypothesis to test, then it's fairly simple to determine the probability of false positives. Let's say in our example that we only wanted to test whether the oxidative phosphorylation pathway is enriched in the treated mice compared to the untreated mice. The probability of a significant result for this test equals 1 minus the probability of having no significant results in m number of tests. If you choose an alpha of 0.05, the probability of false positives is also 5%. If you're testing only one hypothesis, then you'll probably feel okay with having a 5% chance of getting a false positive. However, the p-value is really only valid for one test. What happens if you want to test more than one hypothesis at a time? What happens when you want to test hundreds or thousands of hypotheses? This becomes a lot more complicated. The more tests you perform, the greater your chances of finding false positives. For example, it's not unusual to see 50 or more pathways in your IPA results that are considered significant. If you test 50 pathways at the same time, the probability of getting one or more false positives is about 92%. The more hypotheses you test, the worse it gets. Once you get to about 300 tests, there's a 100% probability of finding one false positive in your results. Test enough hypotheses, and it's inevitable that you'll find false positives. So what can we do about this? You might decide that you could just decrease the alpha to a lower value, like 0.01, .01, so that you would get a false positive result only one out of 100 times. But even with that lower alpha, testing 50 hypotheses would give you about a 34% chance of a false positive, a percentage that's probably too high for most scientists to tolerate. You can still be misled and think that a result is significant 
and incorrectly claim that there's a 1% chance that I'm wrong just because you eliminated some false positives. There are more sophisticated ways of dealing with this challenge. We will never be able to estimate the actual number of false positives, otherwise we would not be using statistics at all but we can control it by estimating an upper bound. One way of dealing with this problem is to think of all the hypotheses being tested as a family and control the family-wise error rate. The most popular method that's used to control the family-wise error rate is named after its creator, Carlo Emilio Bonferroni. The Bonferroni correction method seeks to control the family-wise error rate. The family-wise error rate is the probability that you would find even one false positive no matter how many hypotheses you test. This is an appropriate test to use when you want to limit the probability that any of your tests results in a false positive. This correction method adjusts the alpha for all tests. The calculation is simple. You choose an alpha before running your tests and divide it by the number of hypotheses you are testing. For example, if you have 700 hypotheses you want to test and use an alpha of 0.05 as your significance threshold, your new Bonferroni adjusted alpha would be 7.14 times 10 to the minus 5. This method is not used in IPA. Why? Well, it's great to use if you need to be very conservative. For example, if you have a few drug candidates and are going to invest millions of dollars into finding which one is the best drug to treat patients. In this situation, chasing after a false positive would be very expensive and time consuming. However, When you're testing hundreds or thousands of hypotheses, like you do when you generate omics data or when performing an IPA core analysis, you may find too many false negatives when using the Bonferroni method. If you're doing an exploratory study, for example, you run a core analysis with the intention of finding all the biological entities that are enriched in your data set, you may have more tolerance for working with some false positives since you likely will go back into the lab and verify your hypotheses before investing much more time and money into a result. In this situation, a different approach can be used. Instead of controlling for the family-wise error rate, you can instead call each rejected null hypothesis a discovery. An example of a discovery would be finding that the oxidative phosphorylation pathway is significantly enriched in the treated mice compared to untreated mice. Any false positives would be called false discoveries. The false discovery rate, also known as the FDR, seeks to find the expected proportion of false positives among all the rejected, in other words, significant, hypotheses. You can ask, what fraction of my statistically significant results, in other words, discoveries, are false positives? The FDR base method is less stringent than the Bonferroni method, but the procedure is short, straightforward, and powerful so it's often preferred when testing large numbers of hypotheses. Let's go back to our example of the treated and untreated mice to get a better idea of how this method works. Let's say we perform an IPA core analysis hoping to find which pathways are significantly enriched in the treated mice compared to the untreated mice. However, the drug does not have an effect on the mice. And here's an example of what we see in this situation where the null hypothesis is true. The red line represents the untreated mice, and the blue line represents the treated mice. The lines overlap because the population means are the same. Let's set the alpha at 0.05 and generate 750 p-values, one for each pathway. Most of the time, your p-values will be above alpha. However, even though there is no difference between the groups of mice, due to chance alone, you would probably find about 5% of the p-values appearing to be significant. Those are the ones that are less than our alpha of 0.05. These are the false positives that appear to be significant, even though they are not. We can also view the p-values as a histogram. Here, the x-axis represents all the possible p-values ranging from 0 to 1, and we can distribute the p-values so that each bar in the x-axis contains 5% of all the p-values and each bar has a width of 0.05. The y-axis shows the number of times that a pathway's p-value appeared in each bar. Notice that when there is no true difference between the groups of mice, the number of p-values is evenly distributed, with an approximately equal number of pathways represented in each bar. 
there's an equal probability that an experiment's p-value would fall into any one of these bars. In this example, 38 p-values are in the 0.05 bar. This means that we've identified 38 false positive results out of the 750 tests when using an alpha of 0.05. The remaining 712 pathways are true negatives. You may be tempted to accept everything with a p-value less than 0.05, but remember, there truly are no differences between the groups of mice. Basically, it's all noise. But what happens if the treatment truly does have a significant effect on the mice? Again, the red line represents the untreated mice, and the blue line represents the treated mice. This time, the groups have distributions with different means. Most of the time, we'd find the p-values to be below 0.05, because the null hypothesis is false for all the tests. You can see this reflected when viewing the p-values in a histogram. You can see that here, the distribution is skewed. Now, most of the p-values fall into the leftmost 0.05 bar. You will still see values outside of the 0.05 bar, but because there truly is a difference between the mice, these remaining tests with p-values greater than 0.05 are false negatives. Of course, not all the biological entities that you test will be enriched in your experiments. You will likely find a mixture of results that are significant and non-significant. To illustrate this, let's go back to the example of treated versus untreated mice and imagine that some of the pathways are significant with this type of distribution and some are not significant. We can combine the histograms of p-values from the significant and non-significant entities to get a sum of all histograms for all hypotheses tested. This combined histogram will look something like this. As before, the majority of the uniformly distributed p-values comes from the pathways unaffected by the drug. The p-values in the leftmost bar are those that pass our alpha of 0.05 and therefore are our discoveries. However, because we combined all pathway results into one histogram, our discoveries are a mixture of pathways affected and unaffected by the drug. So out of this set of discoveries, how many are true positives and how many are false positives? We can estimate the proportion of false positives in this set of discoveries and separate out the p-values where the null hypothesis can be rejected and those where the null hypothesis cannot be rejected. To do this, we can first draw a line across the flat portion of the histogram where the p-values are uniformly distributed. These are the p-values from pathways where the null hypothesis cannot be rejected. In other words, these are the truly non-significant results. The ones above the line are predicted to come from tests where we can reject the null hypothesis. We can approximate how many tests are in each bar. This line indicates that there are about 35 p-values in each bar in the uniformly distributed part of the histogram. We can use that number as a cutoff to identify the proportion of true positives in our discoveries by extending this line through the rest of the p-values. Since we usually use an alpha of 0.05, we are going to focus on the p-values in this bar. This estimate of the proportion of false discoveries is our false discovery rate. But within these discoveries, we don't know exactly which pathways are true positives or false positives. We just know the expected proportion. So how do we get rid of the noise? One way to isolate the true positives, the pathways truly affected by the drug, from the false positives would be to only consider the pathways with the smallest p-values. This can be accomplished using a method created by Joab Benjamini and Josef Hochberg that most people use to control the false discovery rate. There are several ways that you can use a benjamini hochberg method. You can adjust the alpha and use that new value for all the tests, or adjust the p-values for all the tests. Both methods give the same results. Because many scientists like to have some value assigned to their hypotheses, IPA employs the adjusted p-value method. Here's how adjusting the p-values works. Here's an example of 15 pathways from an IPA core analysis and their associated p-values that were calculated using the right-tailed Fisher's exact test. You start by arranging the p-values from smallest to largest. Each p-value is given a rank. 
Because we have 15 p-values, the largest p-value gets a rank of 15, while the smallest gets a rank of 1. Here, we're going to use the usual alpha of 0.05 so that less than 5% of our significant results will be considered false positives. The formula for adjusting each p-value is the raw p-value times the total number of p-values divided by the rank of the current p-value. We perform this calculation starting with the last p-value in the list. The largest p-value will always be the same as the raw, unadjusted p-value when applying this equation. You then move up the list by performing the calculation for the next p-value and compare the new, adjusted p-value with the one below it. So here, the p-value with a rank of 14 has an adjusted p-value of 0.408. We check and see if that p-value is smaller than the p-value right below it, the one with the rank of 15. If it's smaller, we keep that newly adjusted p-value. If it's larger, we take the adjusted p-value below it. We repeat this calculation for each p-value, moving up the list. You can see that when we adjust the next p-value, we find that it is larger than the adjusted p-value below it. Therefore, we use the adjusted p-value from the 14th pathway instead. We apply this equation to the remaining p-values, and these are now the adjusted p-values for all the pathways. Notice that typically, the p-value adjustments make them larger. We're interested in results with p-values less than 0.05. Out of the six discoveries, we find two are false positives, with their adjusted p-values now greater than 0.05. The four other pathways are true positives, since their adjusted p-values are below 0.05. You can take advantage of FDRs and adjusted p-values in two ways in IPA. First, when deciding which molecules are analysis-ready, before you perform an analysis, and second, when interpreting the results of your core analysis. Before performing a core analysis, you need to determine how many molecules are significantly perturbed in your data set. These are known as analysis-ready molecules. If you have adjusted p-values, FDRs, or q-values in your data set, you can map these data measurement types when uploading your data set and then use these values to set cutoffs in the Create Core Analysis page. Next, you can allow IPA to use the benjamini holkback method to adjust the p-values in your core analysis results. You can correct the canonical pathways p-values by going to the Customize Chart button and changing the Fisher's exact test option to the BH Multiple Hypothesis Correction p-value. Then, when you hover your mouse over the canonical pathway bars, the BH adjusted p-values will appear. For upstream analysis results, you can show the BH adjusted p-values by going to the Customize Table button and select this option. This will show a new column in the table with these values. Causal network analysis results also provide you with an option to show BH adjusted p-values via the Customize Table button. And finally, you can view the BH adjusted p-values in the Diseases and Functions results in several ways. First, you can add the BH adjusted p-values within the table below by selecting the Customize Table button. You can also show the adjusted p-values by first going to the Show Bar Chart button and select the Customize Chart button to change the scoring method. You can also use these same options for the Tox functions results. Thanks for watching this video. We hope that you have a better understanding of the false discovery rate and how you can control it by adjusting your p-values in IPA. These tools can allow you to feel more confident in your discoveries and insights. If you have any questions, please contact us via phone, email, or chat. You can learn more about IPA at digitalinsights.kyogen.com and watch more video tutorials at tv.kyogenbioinformatics.com.